Hello, welcome to Legal Action. My name is David Siegel. Today we're going to be talking about passing the bar. Great subject, and I've got a great guest, my co-host, Jesse Barrientes. Welcome to the show, Jesse. Thank you, Dave. How are you doing? Okay, Jesse, I want to call this our 20th anniversary show. Not 20 years on Comcast doing Legal Action, but 20 years since you and I have walked out of those halls at the John Marshall Law School and said, thank you, I've got a degree, I'm going to try and make a living now. Oh yeah, 20 years of practice, hallelujah. Yeah, and, and what I want to get to is this passing the bar business. I want you to kind of talk about the procedure and how it works. Because a lot of people <clears throat> watch television shows about law, and they have a certain vision of what it's like. Well, it, you know, it's sort of like and what, I, what I like to talk about, just a little bit about, you know, about law school before we get up to that point. But it's sort of like that, uh, that commercial where this guy is, uh, gets on the scale, and uh, he runs around the gym three or four times, then gets back on the scale and didn't lose any weight. You know, it's not going to be immediate. Just like anything else, you have to learn, you have to develop principles, you have to develop, uh, you know, discipline in order to be able to, to think like a lawyer. And pretty much, that's what, that's what law school does for you. You know, you need to have your, uh, your, your bachelor's degree, your undergraduate degree, um, and you get into law school. Uh, uh, there's several different law schools, of course, we're partial to, uh, to John Marshall. Yeah. Well, let's just talk about the state of the economy right now, the, the lack of jobs that are out there, uh, people who are finishing up with their undergraduate degrees, uh, the loans that they have out, uh, sometimes insurmountable to even think of going on to a post-collegiate education and absorbing that additional expense, you kind of almost have to weigh, is there an opportunity for me to make a living there? Do I have any ability to repay these loans? Because I see plenty of attorneys out there who spend the majority of their money just servicing debt so it really might not have been the best decision unless they had an opportunity to get into. Well, it's it's some of the loans are extraordinary. Sometimes, depending upon what people qualify for, not only do you have loans, uh, you have certain grants, you might have other uh, opportunities, other grants from other private uh, places that, and a grant is something generally that you don't have to pay back. A lot of times, too, with your student loans, you know, they can be deferred for a period of time as long as you continue your progress. But I mean, I, that's just going to increase and increase and increase the debt. Uh, who really knows when you get out in terms of an opportunity, uh, who knows what the motivations are to, to be a lawyer? I don't know, what about you? Why, yeah. When did you know you wanted to be a lawyer? Well, during my collegiate career, I knew I wanted to do something with contracts, maybe mixing it into sports agency agency, things like that, but it was so competitive and so corrupt that I was turned off by that whole system. But I figured, you know what, I'll go ahead and get the education. It might help me down the road with business. I tried to move it into some kind of uh, maybe an entertainment lawyer, but again, very narrow field. So I basically fell into what I'm doing based on the need. There was a need out there for people with debt relief, a need for people going through divorce, almost an underserved uh, segment of the population that couldn't afford high-priced lawyers, I kind of jumped in and took care of those people in the beginning. So that's how I basically got started, and uh, I, f I found uh, bankruptcy to be uh, rewarding. Well, and it's just interesting to note, too, that generally your student loans are not going to be dischargeable. I mean, they are dischargeable, but un under extreme circumstances. Yeah, by that you mean they're not going away. You're going to owe them going forward. Them, right. Uh, unless you have the inability to repay it, uh, maybe a disability, it's going to have to be an extreme disability. You're going to have to have no potential to be able to, to earn any kind of an income. And that's the way it is. But, you know, that's okay. You borrow the money. Now you have this education. And that's the one thing about education. Nobody can kind of take that away from you. Uh, you start off, you get your undergraduate degree, and then you go into law school. Now, that's we mentioned that a little bit uh, before. That's kind of where, where they teach you how to think like a lawyer. I know. You can ask anybody who, who may know me or you or any other lawyer. We think differently than, uh, than most of the public. Uh, I mean, that's, that's what most of the training and the discipline and the pounding and the repetition and everything is. That's just apart from the substantive law. Yeah, no, you're right about that. It's like we all all of a sudden came from Missouri, and you have to show us. You have that's to right. prove it. 
we, we, want, we trust you, but we want to verify it. We want to know what's happening. I also wanted to spell one of the most common misconceptions about people who aspire to be lawyers, and that's they watch the TV, Jesse, and they see the, uh, the LA Law and the Boston Legal, and they see a lot of litigation and courtroom experience and all this excitement and drama. And in reality, if you walk through the Daily Center, it's going to be pretty hard for you to find a trial that's going on. There's very few cases that go to trial. There's even fewer litigators who do the, the big trials. So if that's what your thinking is of what law is and that's what you want to do, you might be very disappointed once you really get there. You might be, but there's a lot of uh, experience in terms of hearings and in terms of different kinds of things. Again, it's just like what I was talking about before about the person getting on the scale and running around and, and then getting on the scale again after you know 10 seconds and trying to lose some weight. What you see uh, never, uh, in my experience, is, is there going to be uh, a case that you file and within the same hour <laughs> you're done. You have your hearing, you have your judgment, you have your trial, everything is done and then you get the money or you lose the money or whatever. That's, that's just not going to happen. There is an extraordinary amount of preparation time yeah. that goes into bringing any type of case uh, to trial. And again, we're just talking generally. It could certainly be criminal trial. It could be a divorce case. There are adversary proceedings in bankruptcy. Uh, it could be business. It could be commercial litigation. There's right. all different kind of things. But uh, there is a difference between uh, between the trial. But a lot, a lot of folks will get experience as it comes to a, a hearing. Basically, both sides don't agree. Maybe they've gone back there and talked to the judge, and we'll talk about that maybe in a little bit. And uh, so they present their evidence, the other side presents their evidence, and the judge makes a decision based upon that. But right. do, do you have any kind of, uh, since it's our 20-year kind of anniversary here, uh, any kind of, uh, do you remember those wonderful, wonderful days uh, as a, a first-year law student and uh, sitting in, in in class, and what they do, folks at home, is they, there are certain case law that that you have to read and you have to brief. When they talk about briefing, in other words, you read it, you have to uh, kind of figure out exactly what the facts are, exactly what the principle of law is, and then what the application that the court had made. And and, and there's different circumstances that might fit into that completely, might just be a little bit. And there's other cases, and so they make you stand up. It is the Socratic method. And they make you stand up in front of your peers. It could be, what, I don't know, Dave, maybe 50, 50 to 100, 100 uh, uh, people that, that probably if you're just first starting out uh, as a first year and you're, you're, first class, you're, you're probably not going to know. And they're going to berate you. Yeah. It's your first opportunity to actually speak in public, uh, have your voice be heard, uh, have it be criticized by the uh, professor in most cases because you didn't do exactly what they wanted you to do. It's almost impossible to succeed in this uh, endeavor from that standpoint. And you, you might want to mention too, Jesse, that there's, there's companies that provide what they call canned briefs, which are summations of what, uh, what the professor is going to ask you. And of course, the professor, if, they know, if he knows what he's doing, is going to ask you something that's not in that canned brief right. that you read to try and save time. They're like cliff notes, exactly. Right. Either there's no substitute for the experience, and you're going to use it Trust me, trust Dave, trust yeah. the you're going to talk to on this. You're going to use it later on in your career, and so you're going to want to you're going to want to take your your diligence, due diligence, to make sure that you get it. But just imagine you're standing there, and he's asking you questions that you're not going to know because, like like Dave said, it's true. Yeah. You don't know what they're expecting of you, and and they're going to belittle you, break it. And there's a reason for that. And you need to be able to handle that type of criticism because you're going to get it from the judge. You know what? We have a lot of wonderful judges in Cook County, in DuPage County, in especially uh, Cook County, in, in, in DuPage. Will County, and uh, you know, in Kane yeah. and and LaSalle, uh, Ottawa, all these other places. You know, but there are a whole bunch of judges. Some judges have different temperaments. Some judges are, you know, don't seem like they're always happy. And uh, so you're going to get. The, and, and besides, besides that. As human beings, you know, we're all going to have a bad day. Right. Maybe a couple of bad days. And everyone's caseload is different too. That's Some true. Some judges have a, a much heavier plate than others, and it causes a problem. It depends. I mean, if you're here in domestic relation and custody issues, and you're hearing all this stuff all the time, it does take its toll on you, like everything else. So you are going to receive those type of things. So that's what they're seeking to prepare you with. You know, I, I remember one time, the the very first time, and I won't, I of course, won't mention any names other than mine, of course, here, and uh, you're supposed to. To uh, 
you're supposed to brief it. That means you're supposed to actually write those things out that we talked about earlier. Book briefing is just highlighting certain things in, uh, in the case that you've been given in the book and making notes in the margin and stuff like that. That is something they did not want. They wanted you to write it out. And I remember going in and there was a, there was a female that they called on and uh, she wasn't prepared. And the professor kicked her out of the classroom. Now again, this is like the first, for the day. first day, right, for the day. It's like the first day or so and okay, all right, everybody's looking around. And who do you think the very next person he called on was, Dave? <laughs> JVB. Right. He called on JVB. He called on me. Now, I did a book brief, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> so you know what I did? I just picked up a blank piece of paper and I stood up. I had my book in front of me and we went through that process. And, you know, uh, and again, that's a little bit about thinking kind of on your feet. Yeah. Hey, if I said no, I didn't have a book brief, I know where I'm going because I already seen somebody else. Right, but it taught you you better be prepared. Absolutely. You better take detailed notes and, and you better give it your best shot. Give it your best argument, win or lose. That's right. You're not going to always win. You're not going to always convince the court or the uh, jury or the judge of your side. Sure. But you want to give it your best argument going forward for your client and for yourself. Right. Well, let's talk a little bit. So, so we know how they, how they get that particular uh, out through the Socratic method. They ask you questions about the case, and then they, then they talk about it. And that applies to all the areas. Basically, we talk about contract law, criminal law, criminal procedure, civil procedure, and we can go on and on with respect to that. And how long would you say a semester was? Well, a semester is 15 hours. So at the end of the year, you were tested. Or at the end of the semester, end of the you were, semester, tested, you were typically, tested, and it was mostly a written uh, essay. And you really didn't know exactly how you did until the, the grades came back several weeks right. later. But you, again, you, you lay out all you know, basically, what you put in your head and apply it to, to that fact situation. One test. Unlike I me, mean, maybe some of the writing courses, it was based upon the assignments that you did, the writing that you did throughout the class. but. The other subjects, there was one test, as I recall. I mean, I could be wrong. I'm yeah, pretty typically sure. one test. At the end. And when we get to the bar part, oh, yeah. we'll, we're we'll, going to talk about that. There's, there's, we're tested on classes that we never, ever took. Yeah. So you're learning this information for the first time in real close proximity to the bar exam. So not everything on the bar exam you took in school, right. even though you spent 90 semester hours to get your degree, your uh, JD degree, Juris Doctor degree, you still haven't covered all the material that's on the test to pass the bar and actually be able to work. That's right. But there is a curriculum. There are certain uh, classes that, that you have to take, and uh, those, those are without exception. Yes. In, in the, the electives and, and then dependent upon what you might want to concentrate in a little bit more. Uh, and, of course, you would take more, uh, more classes in, uh, in those areas. Yeah. Now, I think for, for my personal opinion, I would have been better served back in the old days where you apprenticed with somebody in an area that you liked and you got good at it. You know, what you do every day and what you do all the time, you get pretty good at. So if all you do is criminal law, or if all you did was review contracts, you'd get pretty good at it. We don't have that opportunity to do that when you're in law school and when you're studying for the bar. It's not till you actually get out in the field where you can kind of pick or hope to find something that suits your fancy a little bit that you can start to develop and become more of an expert in it. Right. So I like the apprentice method. Obviously, that, that method doesn't work well for law schools. It doesn't make them any money. And it doesn't keep you in school for three years. So there, there is a, a monetary capitalistic situation here. Well, you, you have a couple of different things. I mean, there's a lot of folks who, uh, who either did internships or had summer associate positions. So during the summer, if they did really well, and it was usually the people that were on, on the law review who wrote all the articles and, and those kind of things that got some of the, the, the better, really extraordinary high-paying jobs during the summer, and the hope was that they, at some point, would get hired by that particular firm, and they would have a taste of those things. But primarily what they're going to be doing in, in, in that case, they're not, they might be going to court with a partner with another attorney. They're probably rarely going to be arguing something. They're going to be in the library doing research. They're going to be writing briefs. They're going to be uh, providing support for whatever attorney they're associated with. And the, the, true, the, the same is true with uh, the particular internships. And as, again, I, as I recall for those, uh, you, you go someplace uh, to a law firm and, and you intern and, and you don't get you don't get paid, unlike the summer associate positions. You don't get paid for the internship, but you have to pay the school for your credit hours. Right. And so you get some of that experience. And then one of the uh, things, uh, I, I believe they was called like the 7-Eleven license for, for criminal law, you could be a prosecutor or public defender. You'd have to be under the direct supervision of one of the 
the, you know, a licensed attorney, you know, either an assistant state's attorney or, or public defender or something like yeah. that. It, it allows the uh, individual law student to practice in a limited method before the court while not being officially licensed. So it's a 7-Eleven license, yeah. a special license. But I think um, that's more the exception than yeah. the rule if you ask everybody who was in there. I, you know, I, I think that... Uh, yeah. I, I want to bring play. this economic question around full circle because when, when we came out of school, in 1991, we were in the midst of a recession. Jobs were tough. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people graduated. They passed the bar, and they didn't actually even practice law. They went into other areas where they can survive. Uh, then we saw kind of a rise. Eventually, we pulled our way out of it. In the early 2000s, things were going pretty well. I think uh, President Clinton was still in office, I believe, and the country was doing pretty well economically. Now we're seeing that drop again. We're going through another recession or even our, a Great Depression for for our lifetime, there aren't limited jobs. Uh, legal jobs are, are, are shrinking. They're being condensed. Firms are, are, are shrinking. Uh, what would you advise someone who's maybe in their final year of college and they're ready to take the, the LSAT exam and, and they're thinking about law school? What do you tell them in this day and age in terms of viability going forward? You know, uh, that's a very interesting question. And, and, and let, me, let me just give you a, like yeah. a personal thought here. I've always known I was going to be an attorney from as far back as I can remember, and that was primarily because that's what my dad said I was going to be. So that was fantastic. Yeah. Well, so you we also had... were in the courtroom a lot as a kid, right? No, <laughs> no, Dave. Uh, sure? No, that's not that's not oh, true. Okay. I, I I may have taken it's a rumor. A, I may have taken a ride or two in a police car, but I've never been arrested. Okay. okay. But uh, so I, I've always known that you know took um, uh, classes or, or was. Uh, uh, senior class uh, vice president and just other kind of things, student council and all that, to kind of kind of prep me for that. There, This is America. There is no springboard like the legal springboard. It opens up the windows and doors of opportunities to many, many different professions, many different careers, many different kinds of entrepreneurial types of things. The law is the foundation of America, of everything that we do. It's a nation of laws. That's what they say. And every, every year, if you look on you know, New Year's Day, if you watch the television, oh, here are some more laws, just so that you know that have gone into effect this year. Just for example, uh, I believe uh, that uh, come January, this uh, upcoming year, 2012, uh, uh, you're going to have to buckle up if you're in the back seat of somebody's car. That's just one example. But I say that to really? say, oh yeah, but I say that to say that, uh, sure, it's an economic consideration. Where are you going to make your money and everything else? But there, there's nothing uh, like that experience as a springboard. And you, there, there are a lot of people who don't really get licensed. They have their Juris Doctor and maybe they they go out and they teach or they do something else or they work for another company in a different capacity that doesn't involve them doing those kind of things because again in order to practice law you have to be a licensed attorney. Yeah well that's one of the problems I think with law school is that it really isn't a good training ground. Uh, there's a lot of education, there's a lot of theory, there's a lot of knowledge but you really don't get a whole lot of opportunity to show your wares and to try some of these skills to see if you're going to be a good uh, attorney. For example, when we graduated, there was nothing telling us where to go to file a case, the court system. I mean, they didn't even, we didn't even go to the Daily Center, even though the law school was a yeah, block away. Yeah, yeah I remember those. Or the those, federal building, rather. Federal, right. So you really, we weren't taught really how to do it. It's, it's, it'd be like uh, being a race car driver, and all they do in the school is teach you the theory on what the engine does and all that, and they don't really let you go around the, the track at all. So you really don't know until you come out if you're going to be able to stand on your feet or whether you're going to have to go do something uh, completely different. Well, uh, a few years ago, again, I, I, I forget it. It might have been a, a couple, a few, or even more than that. Um, like many other states, we have for lawyers who are licensed continuing legal education. And depending uh, upon where you're at here in terms of the alphabet, uh, you have to take a certain amount of hours uh, that and you might get audited. You, you have to do that to continue your education. But what they have now for new lawyers, which is something that they didn't have when we got out, was the basic skills that are required. That's a, a series of classes after your lawyer, after you have your license, that you receive, uh, you know, just the one time when you come out to satisfy that basic skills uh, test a need and you know some of those things walk you through exactly the same things that you're talking about because they realize that that they really haven't haven't trained them in, in that way and I will tell you this 
you go to DuPage, it's a little bit different than when you go to Cook, it's a little bit different than when you go to Will, it's a little bit different when you go to Kane, it's a little bit different than when you go to Kendall or you know, any other place. Every different, right. every clerk is different, every judge is different, they all want different things. Some want courtesy copies, which means you have to give them briefs in advance so they can read it, others you don't. Uh, there's all kinds of different rules, so yeah, you're right. Uh, you can even know Cook County real well, and you can't necessarily practice real well in another county until you get your right. feet wet. And that's why you get in trouble. So, it, you know, it's really good. And one of the things that I used to do, a lot of people do, hey, you know, it, you ask. And we're all in this together. You ask other attorneys. You, you build up contacts. Maybe you're a member of the Bar Association or maybe you're a Cook County attorney and you're a member of the Cook County and the DuPage County and different, you know, you, you, you just you, you can't kind of ask. It's really good for you. But that's what they'll, they'll do. They'll teach you how to do those kind of things, which, which are important. They didn't have that. I, right. I, I'm thinking about uh, I'm probably going to do uh, something or give a presentation kind of uh, geared toward hanging up your own shingle. Yeah. Let's talk about general practice versus a specialty. Uh, when you came out, you were doing uh, quite I a bit. I my shingle. Of, right. And you were doing quite a bit of general practice. General so practice. If, uh, if a criminal case came along, you learned it, you did it, you represented them. That's correct. If it was a collection, a contract, a personal injury. Divorce case. Yeah. And to me, I, I wanted to be more specialized. I wanted to learn under the tutelage of one person. I wanted to eat, Dave. <laughs> well, you could have eaten. You just have to eat a little yeah, differently. Uh, true, true okay? enough. Quit with the filet and the, and the lobster and uh, go to the mac oh, and cheese and the ramen. Yeah. Uh, but I, I wanted to learn under somebody and get general skills, but I didn't have that opportunity because there weren't jobs out there. So I did what you did. I hung a shingle, and I learned the hard way. And a lot of times I got beat up in court until I learned the system. And then after a certain number of months, I started holding my own, and then I started winning. So it all comes down to some experience, getting used to what you're doing, and knowing your area. So I just don't know how you did it as a general practitioner. Because I'm, I'm talking about the experience I had, and I was pretty much a specialist in one or two areas. Sure. You, you get a, a lot of things. Uh, first, what happens when you're going to law school, especially when you get your law degree, everybody is going to come out of the woodwork, and, and I, I guess that's okay. Um, family uh, are going to put the arm on you and uh, tell you about the parking ticket or tell you about this or that. People that you know, you go to a party or something, they're gonna, the line is going to form. And uh, for some people, uh, for example, you know, it still happens now to some extent, and it bothers my wife uh, more than it bothers me. I've just gotten used to it. Eh, you know, is what it is. I don't, okay, whatever. Because you're at a party to relax and unwind and everything, but hey, it's okay. No worries, fine. Whatever we can do to try to help somebody out, we'll, we will absolutely kind of do. But when you do the, the general practice, because here's the deal. If somebody comes, it's sort of like a, a doctor, and they actually, a JD is a doctor. It's a doctor of jurisprudence. Right. Somebody wants to be comfortable. It's just like the mechanic. You go to a mechanic that you trust. You go to a mechanic that, hey, listen, didn't, uh, didn't rip you off, um, who really told you straight, helped you out, gave you a fair price and everything else, and, and then now uh, I need some tires, and I'm going to you, and, oh, you can't help me out. Well, that's... That's a little bit of a disappointment for me. Uh, for quite a long time there, uh, most of the client base, and you know, we didn't do any advertising for, for a long time, were, were just kind of repeat type of clients. And of course, you do have that sometimes with criminal stuff and some other things because people have different needs. Somebody might get a traffic ticket. Somebody might have a divorce issue. Somebody might want to buy a piece of real estate. They want to incorporate their business. Um, maybe they buy, bought the house and uh, there was something wrong with the house and so now they want to recover uh, for what wasn't disclosed or something like that. Just a whole bunch of different things. And it, it's difficult because you have to have that broad kind of base. And that's kind of back to law school, talk about the circle. That's kind of what they teach you. They do teach you certainly substantive law, but they teach you a mind frame. Remember we're talking about thinking like a lawyer. So basically to be able to pull out what potential legal issues might be in a particular fact situation. Right. So it's not all, it's not all like you see on television. You go to a right. tailor, you get your nice suit and I'm ready for the courtroom. Now, should a young person who's thinking of law school, should they get hung up on the different types of law schools or what's a good one, what's not the same reputation, or should they just seek to get accepted? Because once you take the bar, it doesn't matter where you went to law school, right? Everybody has to take the same bar in Illinois. And that, when you interview, it's going to be, you're going to be selling yourself, not necessarily well, the school that's on your resume. Is that true? You know, that, 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 there's two different kinds of thoughts about that. Uh, certainly, if... I've come from Harvard, and that I've got my degree from Harvard. Uh, you know, this bigger law firm may be more inclined to hire me 
over somebody else, another candidate. Right, but that law firm might not job. be a good situation for it, you. It, 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 it might not. That's true. The basic, the bottom line is, hey, listen, you can learn any place you go. Uh, you know, if that's what you want to do, and that's what anybody at home wants to do, then do it. You don't have to go to Harvard. You don't have to go to Yale to to be a successful, thriving lawyer who is going to help out the people in your community. Yeah, I believe things happen for a reason. Um, we all have the ability to pull ourselves up, knock on doors, sell our services, sell our sell services to the public, to other mm -hmm. employers. So I don't think it's so important to get hung up on the law school you went to. I mean, do a good job at your school, work hard, pass the bar, and in the next uh, show we're going to get into the particular topics that you have to be proficient at to pass the bar. Sure. But, but be darn good when you get out. Well, there, there are, I mean, you know, there, there are, make no mistake, there are a ton of lawyers every single year that goes by. Some of them, they go into different areas. They specialize. They do this. They, they do that. Maybe it is into, you know, a business where you just represent one big corporate client as a corporate counsel or something. But, you know, for the people at, at home there, if that's what you want to do, again, it's a springboard to many different things. Don't let anybody tell you that you can't, but you have to put the work in. You can't just expect that it's just going to happen. You have to put the work in. When you put the work in and you're diligent and you're disciplined and you try, you're going to reap uh, and sow uh, those, those benefits, what you sow. Right. What do you say to the fact that there's just so many lawyers in a particular county that it doesn't make financial sense with the cost of schooling going up and the loans? Where do you draw the line? Where does it get too much? What if it's $250,000 to graduate law school? Is it then feasible to be a lawyer? Well, I don't think so. It depends on your particular financial situation. Look at the look at a doctor. I'm sure that it costs more for a doctor. But again, you, you kind of look and weigh out the long term consequences. And just you know, just just for, for example, hey, you know, they've just constantly expanding areas of the law. For example, the new civil union law has just now exploded a new area, a new uh, market, a new uh, demographic for for the legal profession. Now, going to this a little further, what, what does this mean in terms of uh, new opportunities for lawyers? Well, uh, any time that there is uh, a new requirement or something that is a little bit unique that has to happen or a major shift or change in the law, it, it creates a big vacuum, similar to when the bankruptcy laws change. I don't know how long it's been now, Dave, maybe three, four, uh, five years or whatever, and they required, they required counseling. Uh, now that opened up a, another big, huge uh, business for the people who were providing those counseling classes. And now, for example, if they have the new civil, uh, civil union laws, that is going to open up uh, new needs for everything else, going to open up new needs for people who are going to need to do maybe prenuptial agreements, maybe people who are going to get divorce, custody, uh, property rights, division, and all different types, and, uh, you know, domestic or, or orders of protection and everything else. Be careful what you wish for. I'm not wishing for it. I, hey, this is what yeah. this is what our uh, law has dictated, and and you know we we've elected those people, and that's what they voted, and that's what it is. Yeah. Doesn't well, mean you have to agree with it. Well, another topic for another show might be that the legislature and the lawmakers, instead of proving what they do by creating all these laws, maybe they can just be stewards for the laws for a couple of years. It'd and be just, nice. Just oversee them and make sure if there's something that really needs a fix. Let's do it, but let's, just, let's not just create for the sake of creating. No, but then we wouldn't need them, would we? That's true. All right, Jesse Barantis, thanks well, for joining me today. Day. We've been talking about passing the bar. My name is David Siegel. We'll see you next time on Legal Action. Take care. Mm -hmm.